Welcome to River Church. Got some new faces here, got some old faces here, got some middle-aged faces here. Glad to see you all. Yeah. Um, we are wrapping up our Genesis uh, study. We've been in the book of Genesis for, for months, really for like a year. We've, we've left it for a while and done a, done a topical study, and then we come back to it. And, and so anyway, uh, this week and next week, and we're done. Um, so before I preach the second uh, from last, from the, the penultimate Genesis uh, sermon, uh, before I do that, I want to talk to you about what's coming up next. Uh, in just a few weeks, we're going to start this new uh, series called Community Matters. Uh, and it is not just a preaching series, it is a campaign not a, not a money-raising campaign, but a campaign meaning that everything about River Church is going to be permeated by this truth and this, this teaching and this, this study. The fabric of River Church will be, will be colored and dyed and, and affected by what we're talking about during the 10 weeks of this campaign, Community Matters. We'll be studying together on Sundays. We'll be coming back on Wednesday nights for table groups. We'll be sharing a meal together uh, every Wednesday night. Um, Icon, you're going to have a couple of tables for our youth. You'll have your own table. It'll be uh, 10 weeks all about Community Matters. I'll tell you that because I want you to start getting geared up for it and start preparing your calendar. Wednesday nights, I got to go to River Church. Sunday mornings, got to be at River Church. I don't want you to miss any one of the 10 weeks. I told you this last week, and I don't say this often at all, but this series is going to be a culture shifting series for us as a church. I wouldn't say that if I didn't mean that. It's going to be a culture shifting series. 10 weeks for us as a church. So I don't want you to miss any one of those Sundays or Wednesdays. All right. Now, let's jump into our second from last. You think I got it? You're the bomb. Thanks, man. You can take the rest of the, the rest of the morning off, okay? <laughs> so I have some... Uh, some news that is not not new to you, but it is beautiful news. It is it is a beautiful truth, and yet it is worth saying over and over and over again. It is it is central. It is central to the teachings of Jesus. It is it is central to who we are uh, as as Christ's followers, and that central truth is that God is absolutely sovereign, which means that he is in total control. He is in total control of every aspect of your life. And, 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 I, and I believe it to be true that if I, if I went around the room and I asked you, uh, because you're a beautiful group of, of Christ following people, if I said to you, or if I asked you, is God sovereign? You would say yes. His jurisdiction, God's jurisdiction and rule have no limits. God's authority and control are boundless. God's rule is international, yes, in that it, in that it, in that it crosses national boundaries. It, it crosses time zones. God, God's, God's rule and reign, his sovereignty is, is international. It's global. But it's not just that. Think on this for a moment. God's, his jurisdiction, his sovereignty is universal. In nature. It is not only limited to this globe, to this planet. You cannot escape the sovereignty, the control, the authority, the jurisdiction, the rule of God. You just can't escape it. 
Isaiah 46 says this, Remember the things I have done in the past. Remember them. For I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass. For I do whatever I wish. That is what the Lord wants us to know of His nature. That's how the Lord wants us to understand His sovereignty. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. So if I was to not just, if I was to leave this room, this, this body of believers, and I was to travel around the country, I was to travel around the globe, and I were, and I were to ask any Christian, any true Christian, any, any, any person who is truly following the teachings of Jesus and truly is humbling herself, humbling himself under the authority of Jesus Christ and his lordship, if I asked any Christian, is God totally in control of every aspect of our lives and this world? He or she, uh, any good Christian would say, absolutely. But, but, if I asked, is God sovereign over your suffering? It becomes a much more complex question for us to answer. If I, if I asked you, is God sovereign over your own intense personal suffering? If that's the story of your life, it might be sickness, it might be illness. In today's scripture passage, it's really, it's really the, the intense personal suffering is really one of sin and abuse and victimization. Maybe the, own, may, may, maybe the personal sort of trauma that you have experienced in life. If that's the story of your life, the question... Was God sovereign over that becomes super complex, doesn't it? Or maybe you're not the victim. Maybe you're sitting in this room today, uh, a person who has, who has victimized. Maybe you are sitting in this room today as someone who has in the past been the perpetrator. Where was God in all of that? Was God in control of that? The God who says, I do whatever I wish. Was God sovereign over my own intense personal suffering? Proverbs 15 says this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. And if we're honest with one another, every one of us in this room has asked this question, God, where were you when that took place? God, where were you when that came to pass? I remember it was 20 years ago, or, or, or maybe more, and Lydia and I were members at a church, and, and I was one of the pastors on staff, and, and we had this, this friend, and she was about our age. We were all adults, obviously. And, and I remember the day that her, her father walked through the church doors, and I remember over the course of the next few weeks and months the, the ashen look on her face because her father was her perpetrator. 
her father was her abuser in her teen years, and now she is a, a grown lady, and he is, he is now coming back to church for the first time in a long time. What I want to show you this morning, what I want to compel you to believe this morning is that God can be sovereign over it all without being guilty. This room, this morning, if we're honest with one another, and we, we tend not to be at times, but if we're honest with one another, it's a room filled, of, filled with victims and perpetrators. And some of us can say yes to both. You've been victimized by someone in the past. You have victimized others in the past. Maybe it's a pattern that, that was passed down generationally to you. The interesting uh, aspect, one of the many interesting aspects of today's story of Joseph is, is that, that he now, Joseph, as an adult man, has the opportunity to um, confront his perpetrators. Have you ever confronted your perpetrator? Have you ever been, been confronted by whomever you victimized in life. That's the context of the storyline in this morning's scripture. And what, I, what I want us to look for, and we will find it, what I want us to look for this morning is the gospel story, the, the story of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross runs throughout the entire Bible. You see it foreshadowed in the Old Testament. You see it come to fruition in the New Testament. The story of the gospel, the story of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. What he accomplished for us was, or is, redemption. What he accomplished for us is reconciliation. God and humans reconciled to one another, no longer estranged, but also the victim and the victimizer reconciled the abuser and the abused the perpetrator and the preyed upon the tormentor and the tormented Christ's work on the cross was to cover all of that yes to redeem us to God but also to redeem us to one another let me quickly review the story of, of uh, Joseph in case you've forgotten or, or in case it's been a while since you've read it or maybe you've never, never heard this story. Joseph. Joseph is one of 12 brothers. And Joseph was a victim of human trafficking. Joseph, as a, as a small boy, or, or as, a, as a boy, was sold by his older brothers into this, this human trafficking system. And, and, and Joseph was shuffled off to Egypt, where he, where he experienced unspeakable wrongs. Details that we won't even talk about. <laughs> In time, Joseph went from the dungeon to the palace, and he is now, in today's story, he is now a man of means, and he is now, Joseph, a man of authority in Egypt. He is second in command only to Pharaoh himself, the ruler of all of, of the land. The difference being, Joseph is a foreigner. Joseph is not, in, not Egyptian, and yet he is second in command in the kingdom of Egypt. And so Joseph's brothers come uh, traveling hundreds of miles uh, to Egypt looking for food in this time of, of worldwide famine. Joseph's brothers naively travel to Egypt. They don't really even know he's in Egypt. They certainly don't know they're going to find themselves at his, his doorstep according to God's providential hand. They travel to Egypt 
in this time of worldwide famine because there is a storehouse of grain and goods in Egypt. And according to God's providence, they end up at Joseph's palace steps. But they don't even, they don't even uh, recognize this Egyptian ruler as their Jewish brother. Uh, but he recognizes them. He recognizes the facial expressions, the language, even the cultural aspects of who they are and how they're dressed. The old man, the adult brothers who, who stripped him naked and sold him into slavery, man, I would have. But it doesn't really matter what I would have done. What would you have done? Let's see what Joseph does. Then Joseph could not control himself. Genesis 45. Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. He's speaking to his palace staff and to the guards. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. In other words, people outside of his little, his little space, they heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, it's me. Uh, I am Joseph. I is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dis dismayed at his presence. Several words could be used there to translate the original language. Dismayed would be an accurate one. You can maybe imagine. They were dismayed at Joseph's presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. This is an Egyptian... Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a ruler in Egyptian garb who now, who now conveys to them, I'm your, I'm your brother, come, <laughs> come close to me. What's this man going to do? And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve your life. I'm going to read that again. This is the end of verse 5. I, I bristle. I bristle at this, at this statement Joseph makes. If you're an attentive listener, you probably do too. It's rough what he says again. For God sent me before you here to Egypt sold into slavery. God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you. He says it again. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He says it a third time. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph. His father for decades has believed Joseph to be dead. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you 
and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. He's talking to his, his daddy through, his, through the brother. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come. Joseph knows that because of the prophetic dream that he has interpreted. He knows there's still five years left before it rains, before the crops grow again. Um, there I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and your... Um, and in the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is not my mouth, or that it, that it is my mouth, that speaks to you. You must tell my father all of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. <clears throat> then he, then Joseph, he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck. That was his closest brother. They shared the same mom. These, 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 these brothers had, had different, different moms, same dad. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. After that, his brothers talked to him. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. God, in his sovereignty, if he is truly sovereign, if he truly does what he wills all the time, which he tells us he does, then God is sovereign over the life of the abuser. In your sin, in your brokenness, in the abuse that you have committed, you are unable to escape the sovereign control of God in your life. If you were able to escape that, he would be less than the God of the Bible. How does God work out his will and his way and ultimately redemption in the life of the abuser? Well, so in verse 8, we just read it. Joseph says this, So it was not you who sent me here. It was God. Now think on that for a moment. We clean this story up and make it a picture book for kids, but human trafficking is no picture book topic, is it? He's saying to his brothers, Remember when you trafficked me? You... My adult abusers. Actually, God sent me here. Not you. Now, can you imagine letting your abuser off the hook like that? I want to be quick to say, I don't quite think that's what Joseph, Joseph is doing. I don't think he's letting them off the hook or excusing the terrible, inexcusable sin that they committed. Joseph is, however, forgiving. For his own good. For, 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 for the glory and the fame of his heavenly Father. But for his own good, he is forgiving. He is saying this. Listen to these words closely. Joseph is saying this. I will no longer live my life with the expectation that you got to pay. I, I will no longer live my life with the expe expectation that you're going to pay for what you have done. It's as, if, it's as if Joseph is saying, you don't owe me. I forgive you. What I'm talking about right now is the, the sovereignty and the redemption of God 
in the life of the abuser. But, but it, for just a moment, if I can come back to the life of the abused, if you're the victim, if that's your storyline, have you ever made peace with your abuser? You know, it may not be, uh, it may not involve approaching that person. And I may in some cases, or even in many cases, mm, discourage you from approaching that person. But in your own life, in your own heart, have you ever come to the point of saying, enough, this person doesn't owe me. I will no longer live my life with the expectation that, that somehow one of these days I'm going to get a pound of that person's flesh. I'm no longer going to live my life with the expectation that one day I'm going to make him pay. I'm going to make her pay. Enough. I'm not going to preoccupy myself with this any longer. I'm moving on. Joseph emphatically denies that his brothers were ultimately responsible for the course of his life. He's not saying they're not responsible for their sin. He's, he's not uh, saying that they're not responsible for the grotesque nature of the acts that they have committed. They're certainly responsible for what they've done. He's saying, you're not responsible for the course of my life. The Lord has determined the course of my life. He has set me free. He has set me on this good course. He has delivered me. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. What God is doing in my life, brothers, His purpose, it transcends your jealousy and the acts that you committed in those moments of jealousy. So there's a Christian ethic. There's a Christian teaching that we, that we <clears throat> embrace, that Jesus taught. And it goes like this. No suffering is wasted. No suffering is wasted. It's used in the life of the victim. It's used in the life of the redeemed perpetrator for the glory of God. Joseph was able to say, I in my esteemed position over you, and by the way, I, Joseph, in my esteemed position over you as your Savior, little s, saving you from this worldwide famine, I, I forgive you. This was on God's watch. This was according to God's will. But how does this work out in the life of the perpetrator? Well, here's the story of these brothers, really ten brothers. These brothers of Joseph that they, they, they committed this heinous act, this wretched act, an act that they regretted the entirety of their lives. Throughout uh, chapters 42 and, and on, there are several times where they just bow their heads in, in regret and in sorrow over what, they've, what they did to their brother. It haunted them all of their lives. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're a perpetrator. Maybe you're an abuser. Maybe you fly under the radar because you, you, no one can know. I want you to know the story of these these brothers, these perpetrators, these men who committed this heinous act. Here's the story. As God brings redemption in their lives, these men, you, you know this, right? These men are the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, God did not take these men who had committed this, this, these terrible acts. He did not take them and throw them on the trash heap of life. He did not send them to hell to rot. He fulfilled His promise 
made to Abraham through them. He redeemed them and he used them to build for him a nation, to build for him a people for his own glory that he ultimately one, one day might reclaim people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. He did that with this ragtag group of 12 brothers who were invested and involved in human trafficking. And he redempted them. He redeemed them, actually, for, the, for his glory and for their good. Brothers and sisters, if you are a perpetrator, if you are an abuser, if you have a past that you're trying to hide from, from, from everyone else, just know this. God offers you redemption. God is not done with you yet. There is no sin that he cannot overcome and that he cannot use for his own glory. In 400 years from this story, in 400 years, God will march the Israelites out of Egypt with Moses as their leader, about a million strong, a people. God will march them out, and he will part the Red Sea, and they will walk on dry land, and will go out as the 12 tribes of Israel, one for each of these brothers that we talk about today. God redeems the abuser. If you want to puke when you think of the things that you have done to others, God offers you redemption today. God offers you a brand new start. Where's the victim in all of this? The most difficult question, the question that I really, really can't answer for you today, and if I gave you a sort of quaint theological answer, it would do you no good and it would be disingenuous anyway. The most difficult question for those who have been abused, why doesn't God just end all the suffering? Why doesn't he just end it now? Why does it have to continue? Why did it ever have to start? But, but, but now the question is, why doesn't he just end? Why doesn't he deal with it now? And I don't, I don't have a complete answer. One day, I believe Jesus will wipe away every tear and he will give us the ability to see clearly what we now only see dimly. And we will, I, I believe we will have an answer one day right now. I do not have a complete answer to the why. But I do know, <clears throat> I do know, <clears throat> I do know what the answer isn't. And I mean for this to be helpful. I do know what the answer isn't. Lydia and, Lydia and I, the, and our five kids, some of them are out of the house now. Three little ones are still at home. But, but the, the, the Caulfields, we've owned a lot of pets over the years. And... The only pets that I really claim are our dogs, because I'm a dog, I'm a dog guy. And, and dogs tend to live a really long time in our house. We've got a couple of accidents, so I won't go into that, but, but, but we, we had a... <clears throat> Again, the things that I mean to be funny, you don't laugh at, but the things I don't even think are funny. You know. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Um, <clears throat> We, the, first, the first real dog that, that we owned as a family, it predated Truett, our oldest. Uh, his name was Colt, and he was a lab, and he lived 18 years. 18 years. I don't know if you know about dogs, but that's a long, long time. We currently have two Springer Spaniels. One is, I looked up their birthdays again this morning. One is 14 years old, and one is is. 12. It's two, two females. One's 14 and one's 12. Those are our dogs right now. Dogs have a long time in our house. I don't know the food I feed, the love we give them, or, or, or what, but, but they live a long time. Nonetheless, we have seen pets suffer. 
And I do not like to see dogs suffer. That, 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 that does something to my heart. But what I've come to realize is that the suffering of a pet is uh, it's not the same as the suffering of a human being. And I'm an old softy when it comes to dogs, but, but, but when, when dogs suffer, there's something about just their, their capacity to reason and understand and, 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 and is, is, is less than ours. And so their suffering, it, 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 it's sad, but it's, it, they don't suffer, I don't believe, the capacity or at the level, they don't have the capacity to suffer at the level which human beings suffer. Now, the story of Jesus Christ is the story of the God of the universe coming to earth and being abused and suffering on our behalf and, and, and humbling himself voluntarily and ultimately being executed for our sakes. And the God of the universe has a, 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 an immensely larger capacity to feel suffering than do human beings. If we have a capacity to suffering that is at this level, the God of the universe, he must have the capacity to suffer at a much greater level, especially when his heavenly father turns his back on, on him and he says, he says, my God, Daddy, why have you forsaken me? So a Christian ethic, a Christian belief, is that the God of the universe suffered like that for us. So back to the question, why? Why does the suffering continue? All I can give you today is a reason what the answer isn't. The answer isn't that he doesn't care. Because if we, if we believe the teachings of Jesus and we hold fast to the life and the story of Jesus, then we believe that he cares deeply that he suffered, the God of the universe sent his son to suffer at a level, at a capacity that we can't even imagine. God suffered like that on our behalf. So as we ask the question, why the suffering? Why doesn't it stop? At least what we know, it, it isn't because he doesn't care. He cares deeply. And that is, that is, that is expressed in the life and the death of Jesus Christ. He cares. I don't know why the suffering hasn't ended yet, but, but, but hold to the teaching. The God of Christians, He cares deeply. Whatever the reason that He hasn't ended all suffering yet, it isn't because He doesn't care. We don't have all the reasons for suffering right now. But we know that he cares. We know that he cares and we also know this. We also know that there are redemptive purposes in our suffering. And that it will all end one day. And then one day he will wipe away the tears and he will call us to himself, and there will be no more sorrow, and, and there will be no more sickness, and there will be no more abuse, and there will be the righting of the wrongs. And we will live forever. We will live eternity for eternity in that new scenario, in that new reality. 1 Peter 1 says this, In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that, the, so, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, the genuineness of your faith, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the suffering, the genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor 
at that future coming, that revelation of Jesus Christ. What's this saying? It's saying, hold on. It's saying, don't give up. The genuineness of your faith will be found worthy by Jesus Christ Himself, and He will reward you. Yeah, he, will, he will verify. He will say, yes, that faith is genuine. It's been tested. It's been tried. And it has stood the test of time. Hold on. Wait a bit longer. We as a church... We as a church are made up of victims and those who are ashamed for how they have victimized others. And that's absolutely necessary. That, that is absolutely the intention, the will of the Father. How are we to do that? How are we to do church together? One way that we can do it is, is, is how I've seen it done in the past, and then that is nobody admit anything. Nobody talk about their junk. Nobody talk about their past. Let's just all pretend as though it didn't happen. And then when people come in who are a little more transparent than us, they feel like they don't belong. Right? But we don't want to be that kind of a church. What does 1 Corinthians say? It says, if one member suffers, all members suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What does that mean? It means that we're in this together. It means that we're a ragtag bunch of people brought together only, only by the name and the fame of Jesus. See, if we were just a church that was just, 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 just a church of victims, like just that's, that's our identity, that's who we are. We're just all victims. I don't believe that would be Christ honoring. If we were just a bunch, just a church that, that all had the same, all had the same hurts, habits, and hang-ups, we'd all committed the same crime, and we're just a, a church of perpetrators. I don't think that would be honoring to the name and fame of Jesus Christ. Ah, but to to be a diverse, transparent. broken group of people who come together and admit that our only hope is Jesus Christ and that's the only reason that we're bound together. 1 Corinthians 1 says this, For consider, consider your calling and think on this, River Church, think on this as it relates to us as a church. Consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards hang on these words. What's Paul saying? Not many of us were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many of us were powerful. Um, not many of us were of noble birth. But, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. What's Paul saying? He's saying like by the world standards, we're, we're foolish. We're simple. We're not that smart. Not that well educated. Collectively, not so. He's, he goes on, he says, By, uh, God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong, and God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not. I underline that myself for emphasis. God chose even the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. What's it saying? What's it saying? It's saying God takes God takes a bunch of nothings by the world standard. And he builds his church on their backs. Remember, remember the instructions of Jesus uh, in Luke 14? He said, 
He said, you invite the, 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 when you throw a party, you invite the, the poor, and you invite the lame, and you, you invite the blind, and you invite the, the, just the, the, the messed up, the down and out. You invite them to your party, but then he makes a promise. He doesn't just say, just do it and grit your teeth. He says, and you will be blessed. Oh, this is the church that I want to see us become. Oh, this is the church that we are striving to be more and more every day, where the nothings by this world standard, where the nothings of this world, where the screw-ups and, and, and the failures find rest and are repurposed for God's great plan. May that be us more and more and more. Would you bow and pray with me?